Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This webinar on adaptive clinical trial designs is being sponsored by two U.S. companies specializing in oncology clinical trials, the Daedalus and Cytel. The Daedalus is a full-service uh, clinical research organization specializing in oncology drug and therapeutic development in the U.S. and Europe uh, from phase one through phase three with headquarters in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And Cytel is a statistical service and software company providing clinical trial design services and statistical software for the pharmaceutical industry located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And recently, they've been pioneering the use of uh, adaptive clinical trial designs uh, in, in trials generally and also in oncology drug development. And both companies can be contacted through their uh, websites. Uh, we are pleased this morning to have with us the founder and president of Cytel, Dr. Cyrus Mehta, an MIT and Harvard-trained biostatistician an expert and author in the field of uh, adaptive uh, statistics. And our goal this morning um, is to introduce the audience to the concept of adaptive clinical trial designs and uh, illustrate some examples where they could be used in uh, oncology. So what's wrong with the current system? Uh, the traditional approach to drug development, as people know, uh, is, is broken down into sequential distinct phases uh, you know, called phase one, phase two, and phase three, and occasionally phase four if you're, you're successful. This approach is guided by go, no go decision rules, is extremely expensive and time consuming, taking an average of seven years to gain regulatory approval, and is associated with a high failure rate in phase three. And I'm sure everyone in the audience uh, has seen new compounds enter the clinic, with, which show ex extremely promising results in phase two only to uh, fail in phase three setting. And in fact, actually over 50% of phase three clinical trials for all drug categories fail, and that number is higher for oncology drugs with an over an 80% failure rate. So the question is, is there a way to improve upon uh, these results and, and methodologies? And companies like Cytel are proposing a more integrated developmental model that increases flexibility and maximizes the use of accumulated knowledge in the clinical development process and, at, and during the actual uh, conduct of ongoing clinical trials. Statisticians like Dr. Mehta are advocating the use of novel statistical tools, including modeling, simulation, Bayesian methodologies, and adaptive designs. And you know, the hope with all these techniques is to reduce developmental time and cost and to uh, you know, eventually increase the overall success rate in phase three. In 2006, Pharma weighed in, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, uh, with a position statement and defined adaptive clinical trial designs as any clinical study uh, design that use accumulated data to modify elements of the study without undermining the validity and integrity of the study. Uh, there are various classifications of these designs, which we will uh, shortly uh, show you. And the elements of the trial uh, that can be modified include sample size, the type of patient enrolled, the randomization algorithm, the primary endpoint, and others. The regulatory response from the FDA and the European EMEA uh, has actually been, uh, you know, met with some cautious promise. And in 2010, the FDA issued a draft guidance uh, on adaptive designs that uh, everyone in the audience can download from the, uh, the FDA website. And uh, its definition of adaptive clinical study design and guidance document provides operational guidelines for sponsors to obtain quality data through techniques such as interim analyses while maintaining study integrity and validity. And uh, it suggested uh, that sponsors, if they use these techniques, work with the FDA and, and also follow the, uh, the guidance document. I'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. Uh, Cyrus Mehta. Uh, he and I will continue a dialogue through the uh, presentation. And Cyrus will provide an overview of the various classes of um, trial design shown on the slide. Uh, we're not going to go through all of them, but we're going to mention two of the designs that can be applied to uh, oncology drugs with, with uh, real-world examples, and that's going to include the interim analysis with uh, sample size reestimation, and talk at the end a little bit about population enrichment strategies. And this is actually very timely right now in oncology since 
a lot of the uh, new drugs entering the clinic uh, have targets. And, um, you know, the question is uh, how to study these, you know, in the context of uh, uh, known targets, the prevalence of the target, and, um, you know, previous data. So, Cyrus? Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, everyone, uh, and thank you for participating in this webinar. Um, so, the, 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 there's a lot. The, the, the term adaptive design is very broad and encompasses trials in the early stage as well as trials in late stage. And you know, uh, this slide shows uh, things which have been already been done adaptive for a long time in phase one, which is where you escalate the dose based on the responses that you've observed in earlier cohorts of patients. These are so-called response adaptive uh, designs. And uh, the idea here is simply to find a safe dose. And then uh, at the phase two setting, which is not so common perhaps in oncology, you try to uh, find two or three doses which are effective, again, in a response adaptive manner by uh, changing the randomization fractions uh, based on responses that have been observed in earlier cohorts. The next stage is where you come to the so-called pivotal designs, designs which are going in for regulatory submission, and that's the uh, area that I'm going to deal with this morning. These em encompass group sequential designs and and then designs where you combine group sequential uh, modifications with sample size modifications, both in a blinded and an unblinded manner. And this is sort of the heart of what I'm going to talk about today with the real example. And towards the end, we'll talk about some even more interesting uh, adaptations where uh, not only do you modify the sample size, but you might also modify the population and look at selected subgroups, uh, which appear to be benefiting differentially for that drug. Now, so, so these are the topics I'm going to cover. I'm going to first deal with the motivation for sample size re-estimation, and I will uh, point out that this particular uh, the approach is applicable to, uh, in, in oncology in particular, it is, a, it is applicable to, uh, uh, to studies where you get a large number of events quickly. So if, if, if overall survival is the uh, primary endpoint, then it would be uh, uh, more applicable to metastatic lung cancer or colorectal cancer or, or, or an acute leukemia like AML. Uh, it perhaps would not be as applicable in, in the breast cancer, uh, uh, adjuvant breast cancer setting where you have a very long survival rate. There, there you might have different types of adaptations. Uh, the case study, specific case study that I'm going to deal with is a real trial, and it, it deals with the metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. I, uh, for confidentiality reasons, I cannot disclose the actual compound that is being tested. Uh, I will, uh, however, motivate the study and then actually design it. Uh, these designs are complex. There is not, no easy analytical method to get an optimal design for these studies. They're typically simulation-based, and I will actually do some live simulations to show you how such designs are created. And, and then I will discuss the, the results of these simulations and end with regulatory issues. And then... Uh, We'll close out with uh, uh, some other uh, interesting future directions, such as population enrichment. So what's the motivation for sample size re-estimation in oncology trials? Uh, well, the primary endpoint is, is usually overall survival, and you only get small gains in overall survival. You talk about gains in terms of hazard ratios of between 0.7 and 0.8, risk reductions of between 30% and uh, 20 to 30%. But these small gains can nevertheless be clinically meaningful. So uh, it's worthwhile to run studies with these small gains. The trouble is that they require enormous sample sizes to detect uh, effects, and that poses a major challenge. So we have a, 
a concept which we have now used successfully in a few trials and have published, which is known as the, the so-called promising zone design. And, and a promising zone design resolves this difficulty by not asking for such a large sample size and requirement up front. You ask for a smaller commitment up front to be followed by a larger commitment only if the interim results are promising and point to a successful outcome. Uh, uh, Cyrus, so, you know, uh, obviously overall survival is the gold standard in oncology trials, but can this technique also be applied to other uh, oncology endpoints, time to progression, disease-free survival? It, it could be applied even more successfully to progression-free survival. Uh, the, the, the success hinges on uh, taking an interim analysis and then looking at events at that interim analysis. So if progression-free survival is the primary endpoint, you'll get even more events at that interim, and you'll have an even stronger promising zone design. I, I mentioned overall survival because most of the time now, regulatory authorities are insisting on OS being the primary endpoint. Now, so here's the case study. Uh, it, the primary endpoint in this study was OS, and the study was designed for 90% power at an alpha, at a two-sided alpha of 0.05. Uh, this was to be a three-year study with two years of enrollment and uh, an additional 12 months of follow-up. Now, as I mentioned, these studies pose a lot of challenges in terms of the resources that are required, and uh, the sponsor was willing to invest in the so-called optimistic scenario. The optimistic scenario was one in which they believed that the control arm had a median of eight months and the, and the experimental arm had a median of 11.4, which corresponds to a hazard ratio of 0.7. Now, uh, you might think, well, gee, you know, uh, it's only it's only a 3.4 month improvement in median, but remember that these are survival studies with very very long tails. So uh, uh, an improvement in a hazard ratio of 0.7, uh, starting from a eight month median, actually means that if you look at the the one year survival rate, the control arm would have roughly a 35 percent one year survival rate but the experimental arm would have almost 50% one-year survival rate. So that's an enormous benefit, actually, even though it doesn't look that, that good when you look at it only in terms of uh, medians. Now, uh, such a study which they feel they can manage and which they feel their drug can deliver requires 400 subjects. 333. It's fully powered if you get 333 events, and it be it'll end in 36 months if you can enroll 400 subjects at the rate of 17 per month. And the 30, uh, 333 events are obviously deaths. OS, yeah, deaths. Now, uh, at the same time, though, there is a lot of uncertainty about the real hazard ratio. It's possible that the, that the, that this optimistic scenario doesn't hold, it's possible, for instance, that uh, the hazard ratio could be much larger. So they want to protect for a hazard ratio of 0.77, which would correspond to uh, 8 versus 10.4 rather than 8 versus 11.4. That's still considered to be clinically meaningful. Uh, however, to protect, to get the 90% power for this pessimistic scenario, you need almost double the sample size. You need 763 subjects if you want to complete the study in three years, and you need almost double the number of events. You need 539 events. So up front, at least, this was not a feasible option for the sponsor. So they decided that they would go for the optimistic scenario. Now, prior to the techniques that we are going to discuss, most companies would have uh, taken their bets on the optimistic scenario and left it at that. And they would, uh, and that's one of the reasons why, uh, as John pointed out in his introduction, 50% of trials and, at the phase three level fail. They are, they are underpowered. So we did want a, a way of protecting <coughs> in case the pessimistic scenario is true, but at the same time, we didn't want to dis uh, design it up front for the pessimistic scenario. And you see why, because the sponsor is actually constrained by resources 
and and time and what happens is that if you design it for the pessimistic scenario you need this enormous upfront sample size commitment and you will and you will get 90% power but then you'll be highly overpowered if if in truth the true hazard ratio is closer to 0.7 which is where the sponsor is hoping it would be so so this is the dilemma you could design it uh, with a large number of resources and then you'd be overpowered at the more realistic scenario or you could design it optimistically and then you'd be underpowered at the pessimistic scenario at the pessimistic scenario that you only have 66% power uh Cyrus we're assuming here that the control arm is going to uh, essentially act as uh, planned yeah. what what happens if the control arm uh, does better than say 8 months yeah so that's another problem if the con if the control arm does better than 8 months but the treatment arm is still at 11.4 months you're again in a situation where the trial will be underpowered and the technique that i'm going to talk about will work in that situation as well it will work in the situation where the where the two treatments are closer to each other either because the experimental arm is not doing as well or because the control arm is doing better than than was anticipated possibly due to improved uh, standard of care now so so how do we do it the sponsor actually decides to adopt an adaptive strategy the sponsor says we will design this study optimistically we were hoping for a hazard ratio of 0.7 so we are only going to commit up front to 400 subjects but we will take an interim look at the data halfway through the trial at 50% information we will look at the data and then we have these three options available to us we can stop early if there is overwhelming evidence of efficacy we can stop early if there is strong tendency that this drug is futile that's not going anywhere and these two uh, options were already available in earlier studies this is the so called group sequential design but to this we've added this adaptive component not only can we stop early for for efficacy or futility but we have the option to increase the number of events and sample size at that interim look if the interim results are promising and uh, as far as you know i think most um, oncologists uh, in clinical development are familiar with you know we use interim analyses all the time uh, for futility and, and efficacy um, though you know we we can decide on how who does it the sponsor or a dmc but if we're going to add the the uh, sample size reestimation we essentially need a uh, independent uh, dmc board is that correct yes you uh, well you need and any time that uh, the data are going to be looked at in an unblinded manner it has to be done completely separate especially if it's a pivotal trial if it's if it's an ex exploratory trial the sponsor can do it but if it's if it's a pivotal trial intended for registration purposes there has to be an external data monitoring committee often the data monitoring committee's charter only mentions early stopping for efficacy and futility but if it's a, an adaptive study the charter will include in addition uh, rules for increasing the sample size and then there will be a separate independent statistical center whose job it will be to to do the interim analysis and present it to the data monitoring committee to extend, and that that's an important role that independent the statistical center has a, a statistician who is experienced with uh, adaptive designs because he will be charged or she will be charged with explaining this adaptive component to uh, clinicians who may not uh, be all that familiar with them yeah and, and that actually brings up another question is if i'm a principal investigator uh, doing a trial like this uh, what am I told uh, after the uh, DMC meets? I mean, essentially, uh, and how, the, is, how the, is the protocol the, amended or modified? The, the charter has to have uh, governance rules. It has to have reporting rules in it. So that there will be a, a, a very small form at the end of the study, and that small form will simply say uh, stop or uh, uh, continue, continue as planned. 
or, or continue with this or, incre that, or increase uh, to, uh, to uh, yes, different yes, patients yes, or whatever. Some, that's it. N nothing more. Very limited communication. And that communication can only com occur between the chairman of the data monitoring committee and a person who has been assigned by the sponsor to, uh, to receive that information. Now, now, if I'm a principal investigator and my the trial does get uh, increased after uh, you know the interim look, uh, should I be concerned? I'll, re I'll deal with that question towards the okay. end. That's an important issue. Of what uh, so I only mentioned uh, the communication between the data monitoring committee and the sponsor. I, I didn't mention any communication with uh, with the investigators as yet. Uh, investigator communications uh, will, will will happen, but uh, and 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 it'll be important that they get uh, the right message and let bring that question up towards the end. Sure. Now, let's go on with the uh, design itself. He said that we would increase the resources in the promising zone. So, what does it mean to uh, specify a promising zone? You can define the promising zone in different ways. Uh, a way in which uh, which is understandable to many uh, clinicians in particular is in terms of conditional power. Conditional power is the power, given, given where you are now, what's the probability that this trial will be successful? At the start of the study, you have unconditional power. That is, you haven't seen any data at all, and you are speculating on what is the chance that this trial will be successful. That's not relevant anymore. In the middle of the trial, what's relevant is given where you are now, what's the chance that the trial will be successful? And so we define promising zone. We can define it different ways. For this trial, we define it as 30 to 90. So in terms of hazard ratio, uh, hazard ratio between 0.74 and 0.83. And this, is, this can be illustrated on the, on the design itself. Uh, so this is the design which we, which we planned for. And you can see that we have planned for 333 events. And, and we'll take an interim look halfway through those 333 events. If we enter this blue zone at that point, that's uh, overwhelming efficacy. That's almost three standard deviations. And you can stop. If you enter the pink zone, you can stop for futility. That's, that's saying that the, at this interim look, the control arm is doing better than the treatment arm. And then what's on the x-axis? Yeah. X-axis is the number of events where you're taking the interim look. Okay. But now the promising zone is somewhere in between here. If So you've your partition that interim analysis into these five zones, the futility, overwhelming efficacy, and then out here, the results are considered favorable. They're so favorable that you don't really need to increase the resources. Over here, the results are so unfavorable that it's not worth increasing the resources. They're not unfavorable that you want to stop for futility. You just go on without change. But in between, this, in this zone, you can increase the number of resources and dramatically increase the chances of success. And that has to be evaluated by simulation. Simulation. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I uh, had experience uh, dealing with statisticians who use uh, that technique. Is this uh, specialized? I mean, do all statisticians know this, or do you need? Specific? You need specialized simulation software to design an adaptive trial. You right. can't do it with conventional software. And you can probably obviously get that from Cytel. Yeah, you can. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you can get it other places. You can write your own code, but the advantage of of using Specialized software, which is already uh, validated uh, and, 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 and is used at the FDA, has certain advantages. So, so uh, getting back to the decision rule itself, we said that in the pro this is another way of looking at the interim analysis. Uh, here on the x-axis, I'm displaying conditional power. And, and so here you see uh, to the left of this arrow, is the futility zone. 
to the right of this other arrow is the efficacy zone, and, and they are between 30% and 90% is the promising zone. In this promising zone, you can have different rules for increasing the number of events. You can increase the number of events uh, by a flat amount, by like a flat rate, uh, subject to a cap, or you can increase it by a flat rate for a while, and then it can taper off if, the, if you're in the higher end of the promising zone, for instance. Or you can have a, a sloping trigger, for instance, and a, and a declining trigger like this. So there are many different rules that are possible. All of them should be evaluated by simulation to see which one is suitable for this particular study. And it's very important that these rules be kept absolutely confidential. They should be in the charter and nowhere else. So basically, the, those uh, what you just described is not selected by the statisticians. It's generated by the simulations. It, yeah, it is done at, at, the, at the design stage through simulation. Uh, and, uh, and then operating characteristics, which, are, which, which the, uh, can be displayed to the company, and the company can say, well, we feel happy with these operating characteristics. But that's at the beginning of the trial. Uh, right before any, data, before any unblinding of data, right at the beginning. And typically, you don't increase the number of events a lot, maybe 50%, maybe at most double. <clears throat> but uh, typically, it's in the 50% in the range. Moving on, uh, here's the schema for this trial. And uh, you can see what, uh, you know, what, uh, what it, it, this flowchart kind of shows you how this trial is, is being run. We have... Um, we have a, uh, in, an interim analysis, and at this interim analysis, uh, you can calculate a p-value, which is like an O'Brien-Fleming uh, criterion. If this p-value is really small, like less than 0 0.0015, then that's considered compelling evidence, and you can stop for efficacy. If, that's, if, that, if that doesn't happen, you continue the analysis, and you compute the conditional power. If that conditional power is 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 really or, or you can or, or equivalently the hazard ratio. If the hazard ratio is more than one, you know like the control arm is doing better than the treatment arm, you can stop for futility. But if it is if it's doing if it's not more than one, you you continue the analysis and you ask, am I in the promising zone? If you are in the promising zone, you would increase the number of events by 50 percent, go to 500. If, you, if you're in the, either the favorable or unfavorable zones, then you would continue as planned. Okay, so now let's now uh, look at uh, how we can simulate this design. Here is the plan. Uh, as I said, this plan is uh, uh, designed for the for the pest for the pessimistic scenario. It is it is it is it is one sided point oh two five or two sided point oh five ninety percent power, and uh, it is it is designed uh, to commit uh, 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 to enroll uh, twenty four over a twenty over a twenty four month period, and take. Uh, Take 333 sub uh, events, 400, a little over 400 subjects. Now, let's say we wanted to uh, simulate this design, but under the pessimistic scenario. So we have a simulation sheet, and the important thing to look at in this simulation sheet is uh, is this region over here, in which you input how you're going to adapt. So if uh, th these are multipliers of the original of the original design. So for instance, if, if you if you don't change the original design, then you have a multiplier of one. A multiplier of one which says you don't change the you don't change the number of events, you don't change the sample size. Now if you don't change the sample size, you don't change the number of events, and the pessimistic scenario is the truth then you may be out of luck. And uh, the way to see what would happen is to actually run 
we will run 10,000 trials now, and then we will verify how many of these trials entered the unfavorable zone, the, the promising zone, and the favorable zone and overall. And then we will also see how many of those actually were successful and how many were failures, if you don't adapt. We haven't adapted. Remember, we have kept the multiplier as one for, uh, uh, for sample size and for events. So with this, uh, in this setting, let us run 10,000 trials by pressing this Run button, and then the software will demonstrate to us what's uh, going on. Um, so this is actually uh, under the null hypothesis. Let's run it uh, under the under the pessimistic uh, scenario in which um, we have a hazard ratio of point of point seven seven and uh, it again. Ah, here, the conditional power has to go from, so the other thing to look at which I didn't show you, is the promising zone itself. The promising zone we defined as going from 30% to 90%. So now, now we have a promising zone 30 to 90. Uh, we have a low, no change. We have a multiplier of uh, 1, and we have the pessimistic scenario uh, going for us. So we run this trial. Um, it's still it's still running under the null hypothesis. Let me see something. You can see on this screen that the uh, that the that, that the power is only 72 percent under this uh, scenario. Uh, So here you can see how often the trial is in the promising zone and how often it rejects in the promising zone. I'll blow it up a bit and you can see that that there's only less than 70% power if the pessimistic scenario is true. And uh, of course, if, if, if you, 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 you could enter the favorable zone, and, you, uh, and if you enter the favorable zone, which you, which you would do 36% of the time, then you have good power, but then you don't have to increase the sample size at all. Now, now, now let's see what would happen, for instance, if we used a multiplier of 1.5 which means we increase the sample size by 50%. And then we now, if we run this same trial, we find that the power jumps up to 85%, 86% in the promising zone. And so 
Yeah, and this is the only time that you would be putting in the extra resources. Only if you entered the promising zone would you put in the extra resources, and you and then uh, you would get 87% power. Now you might feel I I want 90% power. I don't want 86. I don't want 85%. I want 90. Well, then with this tool, what you would do is you'd say, well, in that case, I'll increase the number of events instead of 50% by 60%. I'll have a multiplier of 1.6, and then run it again. Uh, and, and let's see this time what happens, and you find that now now the power is in the promising zone is 90%. So in a, in a simulation-based manner, you would increase the number of resources. Now, to be sure, if you increase the resources, you pay for it in terms of extra sample size. But, 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 the, but the, it's worth it because you only increase the resources if you enter the promising zone. This next slide will summarize the benefits. Just come back to the uh, yeah. other slide. Is this uh, software that you're using, is this your proprietary uh, software? Yes, or? this is our proprietary software. Uh, it, it's, it's specifically designed for promising zone design okay. uh, and, and oncology. And uh, as I said, you know, it allows you to experiment with uh, different promising zones. You can you can change the promising zone. It doesn't have to be 30 to 90. You can say, I want to make the promising zone start at 40 percent, for instance, and uh, uh, and then you know uh, you'll get you'll get you know go from if you go from 40 to 90, you might have even more power, uh, but you'll enter that zone less often, of course. Now it's over 90, 90.6. 90, it, it appears in this case that uh, going from 40 to 90 isn't that different from 30 to 90. So it might be, you might be willing to uh, stay with the broader one. It's very important to experiment beforehand. Uh, now in, in this uh, next slide, we have summarized the results for the case where the sample size was only increased by 50% and the number of events was only increased by 50%. And it's worth seeing what the results looked like. You can see that uh, uh, if you designed it with the optimistic scenario in mind, but if in truth the pessimistic scenario was the case, then I have uh, laid out for you uh, how often do you enter the three zones, the unfavorable, promising, and favorable. What's the power? if you adapt or if you don't adapt? What's the study duration if you adapt or don't adapt? And what's the sample size if you adapt or don't adapt? So uh, you can see that you will, if you, if, you, if you don't enter the promising zone, if you're in the unfavorable or the favorable zone, then whether or not you adapt makes no difference. You, 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 it's still the old study with 400 patients and 333 events. and. Uh, so, so one in three times, you'll be unlucky, and you'll have about 32% power. And about one in three times, you'll be lucky, and you'll have 93% power. But, uh, but if you have adapted, it makes a difference when you enter the promising zone. If you didn't adapt, you are out of luck. You have an underpowered study, 69%. If you did adapt, your power has jumped up to 88%. And that's with a 50% increase in events. You could get even better if you wanted 60% increase in events. Now, you pay for it in the promising zone. You pay for it because the study duration will go up. Instead of a 35-month study, it becomes a 43-month study. And in, instead of 418 patients, it's now 627 patients. So, so you, but you only pay for it if you enter the promising zone, and you should presumably be happy in that case because now the chances of success have dramatically increased. So this is the uh, this last slide of mine shows the attractiveness of the approach. It it says that the upfront investment can be modest. Additional investments will be made only if the interim results are promising. And, but if that happens, of course, then the chances of success are dramatically increased, and that justifies the additional investment. And, and so it's a practical approach for reducing the risk of designing an underpowered study. Yeah. Uh, one question, I'll bring another real-life example in. Um, I've seen a lot of sponsors now combine uh, you know, phase one and phase two uh, trials together 
gain some information and then go right to phase three. But uh, occasionally you have you know questions uh, that still need to be asked, and uh, one of them is dose. And uh, I, I participated in a trial where we studied two doses in the phase three setting um, compared to uh, you know standard. Uh, therapy and what you describe now is essentially two arm design. Uh, maybe just talk about a three arm sure. uh, trial. Yeah, more and more people are uh, interested in in going for a pivotal trial with two doses and control rather than a single dose and control. And uh, now these techniques that I've provided uh, can be extended to the three dose situation in a number of ways. The most uh, uh, the simplest way is to split the alpha into two. That's the sort of Bonferroni approach where you uh, say, well, I'll, 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 do an o, I'll give 0 0.025 to one dose and, and 0 0.025 to the other. So that is a, a straightforward, simple approach. It's a, little, it's a little conservative, but not very conservative. Now, if you, want to, if you really believe that the high dose is better than the low dose, uh, then you can do the so-called fixed sequence approach where you... You first use this methodology for the high dose. And, uh, and then if the high dose works, then you apply the same methodology for the low dose, and you pay no penalty for that, no alpha, because you've pre-specified the sequence of testing. Uh, an, yet another methodology of multiple comparisons is the so-called Hochberg process. In, 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 that, pro, in, in that method, uh, you, you don't have to pre-specify the order, but, it, but you, you test the, the one which is which is doing worse at uh, first and, and if, if at point oh five level and if that makes it uh, good then you don't do any more but if that doesn't make it you still get a, a second shot at at the lower dose so there are many techniques there are many multiple comparisons techniques that can be combined with uh, with these uh, sample size reestimation techniques and and the study does not lose its pivotal status. It, it still protects the type 1 error. And, and how would you construct your, your baseline? All, all the same. You just be treating it as two separate studies. With, uh, so well, one arm versus another. Well, yeah, it'll be, it'll be a, you'll be doing two tests. You'll be doing dose 1 versus placebo control and dose 2 versus control. You'll use the same boundaries. Uh, but uh, except if you're doing Bonferroni, you'll use uh, level 025 boundaries. The approach will be identical. Getting on to uh, uh, regulatory considerations, uh, these methods, uh, first of all, this, uh, we should say that many of these methods were developed by, by, by statisticians at the FDA itself. And uh, statistical methods for error inflation are therefore well established. They, they were de developed by statisticians who understand the methodology. But nevertheless, the FDA guidance classifies these methods as being less well understood. And the question is why do they say they are less well understood when the statistics are well understood? And the reason is they are not concerned about statistics now. They, they know that the statistical methods work. They are concerned about operational issues, logistical issues, biases that can enter into the study and and and, and then the validity of the study is questioned because of this unblinded sample size re-estimation. Someone is looking at unblinded data and increasing the sample size. What signal does that send out? So, so there are logistical and operational biases, and these are the types of uh, sources of these biases. Were the interim decision rules pre-specified or not? Were they carried out as pre-specified or not? Who had access to them? Who prepared the interim report? And, uh, and, and what, what processes were in place to prevent that, those interim results from being uh, prematurely disclosed? Who had access to the interim report in addition to the data monitoring committee? And finally, uh, can these interim results be reverse engineered from the actions that were actually taken? These are all very important questions that need to be addressed in the briefing document that is submitted to the FDA at the time that such a design is proposed. Can you talk about the DMC charter? 
the, the rules should be in the DMC charter. There should be a briefing book with, uh, with, with all the information about the study, and the, and the charter is included in the briefing book. And one of the ways to uh, maintain confidentiality is to have two copies of the charter, one uh, where, where the, all, all these adaptive rules are actually in the appendix. And, and, and this appendix is omitted from uh, the briefing books of, uh, of, the, of the sponsors who, who don't need to know the actual uh, uh, decision rules, but they would be included in the briefing book of the regulatory authorities. Now, who potentially can uh, reverse engineer uh, from, from results? Well, that, yeah. Or the, uh, yeah, that's, that's a really tricky question. Uh, if you go back to, this, uh, to the rule that, I, uh, that I, I laid out, let's go back to the rules themselves. Uh, over here, recall, recall that we, we talked about a 50% increase in the number of events, which uh, means that the, 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 zone, the zone looks something like this, right? The, the zone looks like, like this. Here is the promising zone, and in this pro the rule, if the rule is like this, uh, flat. Then, if you don't increase the, if you don't, if you do not increase the number of events, uh, I mean, if you if you do not enter the promising zone, so you don't increase the number of events, then you cannot reverse engineer anything. You don't know whether you're in the unfavorable region or in the favorable region. On the other hand, if you do increase, but but you you stay with this flat rule, you don't know where in the promising zone. The, the trial lies. It could be at the low end or it could be at the high end. Uh, so, so already there are in place, uh, just from the way the study is designed, uh, a built-in mechanism for preventing reverse engineering. But you must combine this with good processes. So a good process would be that no one even knows what the rule is. No one knows where the promising zone starts, where the promising zone ends. No one knows whether the rule is this way or, or this way, or which, 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 which rule is operational. Uh, all of that should be, uh, maybe, maybe the, the, the in-house statistician who worked with the external consulting company on, on, on the design would be aware of this rule, but even that statistician would not be able to reverse engineer anything from it. Now you did ask a very interesting question at the beginning about, well, if, if the, if the Let's say that the, you know, the interim, the interim analysis is performed, and uh, and then uh, word gets out that an interim analysis was performed. How does that affect in investigators? Well, there's so many different possibilities here that we don't know. We don't know how investigators will react because, uh, and that's one of the reasons why the FDA says these are less well understood methods. If there is no change, for example, if there's no change in the sample size and in, in the number of events, then the investigators don't know uh, whether whether the result was promising or favor, uh, unfavorable or favorable. Uh, if there is an increase in the number of events, they, it, they know it's promising. One way that you would protect investigators from unnecessarily speculating would be to uh, at the uh, to say in the in the study that look uh, <coughs> since you've decided that the maximum sample size is going to be 627 up front you could say that the maximum sample size is 627 and uh, if at the interim analysis you uh, you enter the promising zone you don't make any disclosure if at the interim analysis you uh, uh, you know uh, you you cut back to uh, uh, to, to 417, then uh, you, uh, you just stop the trial when 417 subjects have entered the study. So there are many ways, but all of them have to be tried out and the FDA needs to understand them. There's, uh, so my concluding comments are that, that you need considerable amount of planning uh, to, uh, to obtain regulatory approval for a pivotal study. You need to explain why the adaptation was necessary. <laughs> Could not the study have met its objectives 
by other means, by conventional means. You have to include all the technical details or the statistical methodology supported by simulation results in the charter, and you have to create proce processes for preventing operational and logistical biases. And that's all in the gui guidance document? Yes. Yes. And that's that's something you provide as a uh, you know, consulting service? That's right. Yes, we do that. And then maybe just, uh, we have a few minutes left, yeah. just talk about enrichment designs, especially yeah. with a lot of these uh, you know, biomarkers that are out there and targeted therapies. Yes. So, so this study, these, now these methods, we said, will increase the sample size. It would be interesting to combine them with population enrichment. Combine sample size re-estimation in an unblinded manner with subset selection at the interim analysis based on uh, targeted therapies. So the, the motivation is that there is, in fact, a proliferation of targeted therapies. Uh, for And, and I've just pointed out three that are numerous. One is the so-called, uh, the, the, in the non-small cell cancer, it was noted that 65% uh, 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 responded who had EGFR mutations versus only 5% without them if they were treated with erlotinib. In the colorectal, the well-known KRAS uh, story, where the wild type uh, had uh, uh, responded to the 23% yeah. response versus no response for the mutant type uh, if treated with cetuximab. So, so for targeted therapies, now the, the important thing to note is that these were not prospectively discovered. These were discovered after the fact through a retrospective analysis. So you couldn't take advantage of this at the design stage itself. What we are proposing, and uh, there are a number of uh, people who are working on this problem, uh, some very fine work I would recommend reading the papers of Richard Simon and his colleagues at the, at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, where you propose to start out with all comers, open, open up to a broad population, both with and without the biomarker, but you know which biomarker you're looking for and targeting. And then at that interim analysis, you look at the data, just as we did with promising zone designs, and if the, if the biomarker population enters the promising zone uh, and, and it shows a huge effect, you might then just focus on it. Uh, and, not, and not worry about the rest of the population. Uh, or if, if it looks like both are doing well, if both enter the promising zone, you could continue as planned, but possibly with a sample size increase. The benefit is you don't upfront cut off your options by only uh, paying attention to the biomarker subgroup. It's possible that you could get a broader label. So why not try upfront for the broader label? I think that... Uh, we have a very little time now, so I'll uh, turn over if there's some concluding questions from John. Uh, no, I just want to basically uh, thank you for that, uh, you know, very good presentation. And, you know, these are techniques that, uh, you know, all sponsors now should, you know, uh, consider in the design of their trials, uh, hopefully shortening the, uh, you know, basically developmental uh, time and, and obviously cost. So, uh, costs would probably increase if uh, uh, you increase the uh, the sample size to uh, uh, right. you know, keep your. Uh, uh, you but know, you can only increase the sample size if the results look promising. Okay. Well, uh, and then uh, there are there are other techniques in the in the um, in the classification of adaptive designs that are referenced at the end of this uh, presentation, and you've actually published uh, a, a number of papers on, on it. Um, and I also mentioned that uh, Cytel's working with investigators. They have a, uh, uh, a poster at ASCO that um, uses adaptive designs in, in a real-life study in acute myeloid leukemia. Well, this is uh, Mike White here with Cytel, and uh, once again, I'd like to thank both Cyrus and Dr. Krauss uh, for their time today. And we would like to thank, of course, everyone who joined us today. Um, we want to remind everyone on the line that um, 
Cyrus and uh, Dr. Graz will both be at ASCO this year, and uh, shortly we should learn uh, the the exact details as to when Cyrus's poster um, will be uh, available for viewing, and that will be posted. The uh, the information when we learn the exact the time and place will be on the respective websites, Cytel.com and Medalius.com. Uh, so if you're going to um, Chicago this year to ASCO, you will have an opportunity. <coughs> to meet with uh, Dr. Mehta and, and Dr. Grass too. Um, so watch our respective websites for that. Um, Cytel, of course, is going to be active once again in DIA this year, and that's also an opportunity to meet and speak with uh, Dr. Mehta and our other experts. Uh, also watch for us at uh, a number of uh, other oncology-related trial design events through this coming year. Uh, right now, at the end, when we conclude, there will be a short survey that will pop up. Please do take the five minutes uh, to fill it out. Your opinions, your ideas uh, are great guidance for us as we shape our webinars for the future, including um, our consideration of, a, um, of an operations-based um, adaptive uh, trial for, uh, trials for oncology webinar coming up. So again, the uh, references for today's, these are selected references. Uh, the first two are more in general and uh, overview, but they're, they're, they're very comprehensive and up-to-date. And then you'll see uh, directly below, the, below that the methodology, the more technical publications uh, by Dr. Mehta and his colleagues um, for your information. And of course, all these can be found also on Cytel.com as well. And I think that uh, concludes uh, today. Again, thank you, everyone. Uh, if there were any, if, if anyone would like to replay the webinar in its entirety or be able to jump to any point in the in the in the uh, in the presentation, that will be posted. The link for the replay will be posted by tomorrow, Friday afternoon, at both Medellius.com and Cytel.com. Thank you so much, and good evening. Good day to everyone.